As a continuation of our last video on the Battle of the Bulge, which you can view in the link below, we wanted to focus once again on this historic fight and highlight less known units that took part in that fierce battle. One unit in particular would pay a high price to resist the German advance. The 106 Infantry Division, newly arrived from the United States, had no experience in combat. They were placed on the front lines and the troops were spread thin, as it was thought that the enemy would not be a real threat there. However, as the 106 would soon find out, the German army was making one last major push to reach the Belgian port of Antwerp and to split the Allied lines, allowing them to encircle and neutralize several Allied armies. The 106 Infantry Division was sent to the eastern part of saint vith This would be where they experienced their baptism of fire as they engaged in their first combat. Unfortunately, this first action did not go well for them, and they suffered a staggering number of casualties. Almost 50% of the unit would be either killed, wounded, or captured in the early stage of the Battle of the Bulge. Despite the high casualties, the 106 Infantry Division was paramount for the success of the Allied resistance of the German army as they stubbornly held onto small towns and significantly slowed the advance of the enemy. One location where the 106 offered a strong resistance was Barque de Fréture in Belgium, where an isolated group of men armed with three 105mm howitzers were somehow able to block the German advance from December 19 to December 23, 1944. One of the heroes who fought in this first battle was John Schaffner. He served with the 589 Field Artillery Battalion of the 106 Infantry Division. In 2015, I was very fortunate to be able to visit him at his home in Maryland. After hearing his incredible account of the actions that took place during that cold winter of 1944, it became a dream of mine to visit the area where John saw his first combat and be able to see the places where he so bravely fought. With Battlefield tour guide Bob Connings and filmmaker Joey Van Messen, we decided to visit Barrack de Fréture, known as the Parker Crossroad, to help us better understand the events that took place there. With this video, it is our hope to remember and pay tribute to the brave men who fought at the Parker Crossroad. When the German troops of the 6th SS Panzer Army, 5th Panzer Army and 7th Army launched their counterattack on December 16, 1944, John Schaffner and his fellow soldiers were located near the vicinity of Schoenberg. The entire division was outnumbered and facing insurmountable odds. John and the rest of his battalion were soon forced to withdraw west. Major Arthur C. Parker III was at the head of the 589 Field Artillery and received the order to set up a roadblock at Barg de Fréture, located 21 miles west of saint -Vis. The three 105mm Howitzers were placed in the crossroad in order to fire northeast, southeast, and southwest. It was mostly quiet the day of the 19th as the troops were trying to consolidate their positions, digging foxholes and setting up the Howitzers. The 589 would soon be joined by other American units in order to block the German advance. On the night of December 19th, John was located in an outpost with another GI east of the roadblock in the direction of Ufalis when they began to hear noise getting closer to them. And it was kind of a strange noise. It was like a swishing noise. And uh, I, didn't figure, I couldn't figure out what was making that noise until this uh, group of about 12 Germans on bicycles. And they were only about 25 or 30 feet away. When these Germans got to the mines, they stopped, of course, and uh, they were standing there talking and got Captain Brown on the phone, told him that we had we had a patrol of Germans right in the middle of the road, right where the uh, mines were. And uh, he said, okay, uh, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Uh, we've got the, uh, the 50 caliber machine guns trained on the road and uh, I'll fire my pistol and when I do that, that's a signal that we're going to open up with the 50s. You keep your head down. So that's what happened. We fired the pistol. We kept our heads down. And the 450 caliber machine guns were firing 
right alongside of us, just that much over our head. Wiped out, wiped out that German patrol, literally. Sewell and I jumped out of the hole <clears throat> and beat it back to the command post. The next few days, the Germans attacked the crossroad, but they were not able to push through the lines. Members of the 325 Glider Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Airborne Division were sent in support of their fellow GIs defending the crossroad. German and American troops both suffered significant casualties, including Major Parker, who would be wounded by pieces of shrapnel on December 22, 1944. However, despite its losses, the Americans were able to continue to hold the crossroad. But as they would soon find out, the task would prove impossible. The morning of the 23rd, uh, the Germans started to attack in force. They apparently had gotten some gas and were shelling us. And uh, by that time, Major Goldstein was in command. It was probably about four, maybe in the afternoon. And at that time of the year, it was getting dark. And uh, it, was, it was chaotic. Uh, I, I I was in a in a foxhole and uh, with another guy, and we went in went into the farmhouse, which was a stone building. Uh, this is the the barn. The barn where John was. Yep. That's where the guns here are now as a monument, and yep. we parked right there. So exactly. And okay. So you see on that? Uh, do you see that building? It's completely destroyed. The roof is missing. A part of the wall, you know, the front wall is missing. You can see a tank right there on the right. And uh, yeah, you can see that that house was really in the middle of the fight. Being overrun by the German forces, including members of the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich, some of the American soldiers were forced to withdraw to the farm at the crossroad. Unfortunately, the farm was hit during the attack and the stable became engulfed in flames. The German tanks drove through the open fields in front of the farm and the Americans realized the vulnerable situation they were now facing. Captain Brown gave the order to abandon the farm and try to reach Manhay. The cattle were driven out of the barn and some of the men used them as a shield, running between the cows for cover. And uh, we're sitting there on the floor next to the wall and a, uh, some, uh, a shell of some kind hit the wall right over our head, exploded and blew rocks and debris in the room. And uh, I looked at Harold and he looked at me and I said, let's don't stay here. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of things flying. We, we looked up from the ditch and uh, this farmer had, had some cows and they, they, were, they were in the road. There was about a dozen cows in the road. So they were right near where we were and we snaked their way through these cows to the other side of the road, fell in the ditch. And uh, there was a field there and uh, the Germans were coming mostly down the roads. So uh, we took off across the fields and uh, we didn't get very far when, when a mortar round hit near Harold and, and knocked him down. And uh, I went over to him, and uh, he had been wounded pretty bad in, in the side, uh, left side, I think. And he couldn't couldn't get up. So uh, I'm wondering what to do about that. And uh, I looked down the field, and there's there's two GIs that are coming my way, a couple of infantrymen. Turned out they were from this 325th Glider Regiment. So they come up, and between the three of us, we get we get Harold down to the woods where. They had, they had a jeep down there, and uh, they put him on the jeep and, and, and hauled him out. Uh, didn't see him until 1986. He, uh, he never got back to the unit. <clears throat> Another story. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I stayed with these uh, 82nd Airborne guys until next day. And then a little later the next day, we're, we're moving around. By this time, that, that night, the Germans overran the crossroads. It wasn't until 1986 when there was a reunion of the Division Association to be held at uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And of course, the division was uh, organized at Fort Jackson. Uh, so uh, 
we wound up with 19 people of the of the 589th attending that reunion and uh, <clears throat> that's when it started uh, I started to talk about it with guys that I had known been with and before that uh, I, I, I didn't didn't want to talk about it I guess because uh, I didn't think anybody could understand and I don't think you can unless you've been there If you enjoy watching this video, please like and subscribe to our channel and leave a comment below. If you're interested in learning more about what happened after Barak de Fritjofer and how the 2nd SA German Panzer Division was abruptly stopped, you can check out the video by my buddy Joey Van Messen from Snafu Doc. The link is in the description below.